All right, so we're going to try this on here today. So uh, I'll go through the notes and talk along with it, kind of like a homework video, uh, but it'll be a little bit different, and bear with me if there's some technical difficulties, and we'll try to do it this way. Uh, doing work. What do we call the ability to do work? Uh, or if we don't feel like we're able to do work, what do we say we're lacking? Usually that would be energy. Say, oh, I don't have any energy today, or I'm just out of energy. Uh, so the property of an object or system that enables it to do work is called energy. This is uh, the ability to do work or the property that allows us to do work is called energy and it's measured in joules. Um, you see a couple examples of some possible sources of energy or some possible things that could store energy there uh, in a rubber band, a spring, and a bow. Each of those things um, can store some energy in different ways um, and they are able to do work if we uh, manipulate them so that they can. If we pull the bow back, it's able to push an arrow forward. If we pull the rubber band back, it's able to uh, shoot itself out. If we compress the spring or we pull the spring apart, uh, then it's able to do work on an object. One of the types of energy that we'll talk about is mechanical energy, and that's the energy due to the position and or movement of an object. Either of those things uh, can fit the bill for mechanical energy, either position and or movement. There's lots and lots of other forms of energy, uh, but this is the one we're going to focus on for right now. And the two forms of mechanical energy are kinetic energy and potential energy. You've probably had some exposure to these. Um, kinetic energy, as you might have guessed, is the energy of movement. And potential energy uh, is the potential to do work. It, it can do work uh, based on its position. A roller coaster has several examples of this. As you are moving on a roller coaster, you have some kinetic energy. As you go up to the peaks, you have more potential energy because if, uh, heaven forbid, you fell off that roller coaster, uh, gravity would be doing a lot of work on you, and if you hit something on the ground, you would do quite a bit of work on it. As you go down the roller coaster, you get faster, so your kinetic energy goes up, and your potential energy actually goes down because you're getting closer to the ground. So we'll first discuss potential energy, uh, and it's the energy, it is energy in the stored state that gives an object the potential to do work. And the keywords there are stored and potential. It, it's in the stored state, so it's not actually doing anything right now. It's just energy that's stored. And it gives that object the potential to do work. And there's three types of rubber, or types of potential energy, um, and they each have to do with kind of a simple object, a rubber band, for elastic potential energy, a seesaw for gravitational potential energy, and batteries for chemical potential energy. Elastic potential energy applies to anything really that is stretched or compressed, which gives it the potential then to do work. Um, that, that object then has elastic potential energy. If you can stretch it or compress it, giving it the potential to do work, it has elastic potential energy. Some examples here would be a bow drawn back. As you pull that string back, um, you're stretching the string, you're stretching the bow, you're bending the bow, and then as you let go, it's going to spring back to its original position, shooting the arrow forward. That's elastic potential energy. A rubber band stretched, we've talked about that one a little bit, same concept. A slingshot, also the same concept. You're stretching back that uh, band or rubber or whatever you are using for your sling, uh, and as you let that go, it springs forward. A trampoline is another great example of this using springs. Um, we've got the springs in the trampoline that compress or are stretched out, and then as you go down, it's gaining potential energy and it springs you back up. It shoots you back up because those springs want to compress back to their original position. The second type of potential energy here is chemical potential energy. And any substance that can do work through a chemical reaction possesses chemical energy. And that includes a huge, huge range of items and objects. Uh, this is found in fossil fuels. As we burn gas or oil in our cars, um, we are using that chemical potential energy. The, the chemicals in the gas undergo chemical reactions as they're burned, and it propels our car forward, obviously doing a lot of work to accelerate our car, um, but we don't really think of the potential energy necessarily found in that gas. Electric batteries are a great example of this. Um, the, the items themselves in the batteries aren't exactly uh, energetic, you might say, uh, but they have the potential 
to do a lot of work. As those uh, reactions occur within the battery, a lot of work is done, whether it's by a small Duracell or by a big car battery. Um, and then food is another example of this. Uh, we eat our food in order to give us energy. Um, and that food has chemical potential energy contained within it. As it goes through the chemical reactions in our body, it's broken down. It gives us the energy to live. It gets converted into heat that keeps our body warm. It gets converted into movement as our body moves around, uh, which we would call kinetic energy. Gravitational potential energy is the last one we'll talk about. And it's the potential energy due to elevated positions. And that one is maybe the most obvious of the three. Um, but the higher up you go, the more gravitational potential energy you have. Uh, elevated reservoirs or water towers, are more, are the more common name, are an example of this. As our seesaws, um, as the person who is up goes up, they have more gravitational potential energy than the person who is at the bottom. Uh, as they switch positions and this person goes down, they will have more kinetic but less potential energy. As this person goes up, they will be gaining gravitational potential energy. Um, so that flips as you're on a seesaw. A skier is another great example of this. Um, at the top of the mountain, you have quite a bit of gravitational potential energy. If you didn't, you wouldn't slide down the hill. It would be very simple. You wouldn't go anywhere. That's why it's harder to ski uphill. You, you lack that gravitational potential energy. But when you're at the very top of the hill, you have a lot of potential to accelerate down the mountain or do work down the mountain. Uh, so you're able to slide down the mountain on your skis. This slide's a little different. It's talking about the amounts of gravitational potential energy. And the amount of gravitational potential energy for an object is equal to the work done against gravity in lifting it to its current height. So we're talking about not only the weight of the object, but also the height to which you lift it. Another way to say this would be uh, to say that if I do 10 joules of work to lift an object off the ground, it will now have 10 joules of gravitational potential energy. If I lift uh, an object and work 100 joules to get it off the ground, it has 100 joules of gravitational potential energy. Those two things are always going to be equal. And we can do this in equation form uh, by saying that work equals force times distance. We know that. Uh, that's one of our equations from earlier in this unit. And we also know that force equals mass times gravity. Uh, so the force or the weight of the, of the object is mass times gravity. And the work done is the weight or force times the distance. We also know that the work is equal to the gravitational potential energy uh, from right here. So we know those four things, or those three things, and combining those, if we plug in mg for force, we get mg times d, or height. Uh, we'll use height for our distance right now. And since work is equal to gravitational potential energy, we can get an equation, GPE, or gravitational potential energy, equals mass times gravity times height. Uh, this is a really useful equation for us because it's a pretty simple equation to figure out how much potential energy something has at a certain height. We will always know gravity, and as long as we know either mass or height and uh, one of the other variables, we can figure out this equation and we can solve. So to do just one quick example problem here, it is said that Galileo dropped objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa to determine whether heavy or light objects fall faster. If he had dropped a 5 kilogram cannonball, so our mass equals 5.0 kilograms, from a height of 12 meters, so we have H equals 12 meters, what would have been the change in potential energy of the cannonball? Now, it's important to remember here that at the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and I'll draw this, and this is exactly what the Leaning Tower of Pisa looks like. You should know that by now. I am a great artist. At the top, it's going to have a certain amount of potential energy. At the bottom, its potential energy will equal zero. Uh, sorry, I ran out of room there. But its potential energy will equal zero at the bottom there. That's important uh, because that will give us the change then in potential energy. So we need to find how much potential energy it had at the top. To do that, all we're going to have to do is take GPE, or gravitational potential energy, equals 5 kilograms times 12 meters, 
or sorry, times uh, 10 meters per second squared times 12 meters. 12 times 10 is 120 times 5 would give us 600 joules. So the gravitational potential energy there, the gravitational potential energy there would be 600 joules. And I know that answer was on there already, uh, but I thought it might help us to solve for that. All we're doing there is plugging into GPE equals MGH. That's all we're doing is plugging into GPE, or gravitational potential energy, equals mass times gravity times height. All you have to do is multiply those three things, and you can solve any problem like this. So kinetic energy is the other uh, type of energy that we'll talk about. We've talked about potential, now we're going to look at kinetic. And if an object is in motion, then it is capable of doing work. And that energy of motion, then, is called kinetic energy. There's it's capable of doing work, so it has energy, and that energy of motion is called kinetic energy. The formula here is a bit tough to type in what, I, what I'm using here, so I'm just going to write it in, and kinetic energy equals one-half mass times velocity squared, one-half mv squared. Uh, you'll probably notice that this looks really similar to, the, to our equation for momentum, which was p equals mv except with the half and the squared in there. Um, if you're in calculus you might notice that those are derivatives. Uh, but uh, the point here is that momentum and kinetic energy, yeah it looks like the equations are related, they are related. If you think about something that has more momentum it's also going to have more kinetic energy. Something that has a higher kinetic energy is going to have a higher momentum. So those two are really closely related. Um, the kinetic energy is equal to the work that was done to bring the object up to speed. Uh, so with gravitational potential energy, it was equal to the work done to raise that object to a certain height. Here we're talking about how it's equal to the work done to bring that object up to speed. We'll do one quick problem and then let you go here. Um, we've got a three kilogram ball rolling at two meters per second. How much kinetic energy does it have? So we're gonna use that Ke equals one half mv squared. Our mass is 3 kilograms, our velocity is 2 meters per second, so 1 half times 3 kilograms times 2 meters per second squared. 2 squared is going to give us 4, times 3 is 12, times a half equals 6, and our units here would be kilogram meters squared per second squared which is a joule. So our units there, would, or we would get six joules there for our answer. Uh, with that, I'm gonna let you go. Go ahead and do homework five, or sorry, 6.2 for tonight, and anything else that Mr. Neidhart asks you to do.